Aloha, welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, talking to Dr. Mark Gilbert, the National Endowment for Humanities Chair, Endowed Chair of World History at Hawaii Pacific University. And we're going to be talking about India and the contemporary global economy. So I'd like to welcome you, Mark, to the program. Nice being here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And I'm very excited to hear that your, your book on South Asia and world history, published by uh, Oxford University Press, mm -hmm. has recently been released. Just released last month. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very exciting. Very. Um, can you tell us a bit about what the book is about? Well. Uh, there's a field called world history, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's looking at larger patterns, you know, rather than, uh, let's say, a national history, you know, mm -hmm. very in-depth, detailed look at one country. Instead, we look at patterns that exist almost in all countries. And, but we don't just compare them. Uh, it's a way of getting a deeper understanding, actually, of any individual culture, mm -hmm. nation, civilization, because they're not in isolation. Right, uh, right. Wh whatever they're doing, they're doing it because something has happened external to their own culture. Mm -hmm. culture. And they've either mm -hmm. uh, hybridized it, synthesized it, mm -hmm. or adapted to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Japan is the most homogeneous culture, but uh, it's, its religion doesn't come, it's a Buddhism does not come from Japan. Right, right. And the form of Buddhism that comes to Japan is both uh, global but unique to the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing we, we like looking at. Yeah, yeah. And India provides many, many examples of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a very diverse and, and large civilization, mm -hmm. just the civilization itself. Yeah. Like, we think of it as a country. But, mm -hmm. and, and your book covers, like, just an impressive uh, range of the historical periods from 5000 BCE to, to the present, which we hope to get catch up today. Yes. Yeah, like what that seven thousand years. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> well national history. What is it? National history is easy. World history is hard. Oh yeah. yeah yes, but those mm -hmm. patterns are, uh, for example, every uh, Neolithic civilization has its own patterns, mm -hmm. uh, and yet uh, uh, they do have commerce with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, then, after the commerce starts growing and cultures become in more contact, then you start seeing more borrowing. Not so much borrowing, but a, mm -hmm. using what they learn from other cultures. Of course, the West is so much so a part of that process. But we're so proud of what Western civilization is, we don't recognize that it comes from, uh, let's say, Greeks through Muslims. Right, so, right. So. I mean, yeah, that, that's the thing, is that we're, we're fed a big diet of national history, which is really like, you know, establishes boundaries as yeah. to like what, what people in our nation have achieved in the past. But I mean, really, the reality is with what I think world history illustrates is that there is so much cross fertilization throughout uh, all of history among mm -hmm. all different uh, groups. The world. Yeah. And you might argue it's, that kind of approach is needed more than ever because we have this uh, tendency towards uh, turning inward going on throughout the world in almost every culture, mm -hmm. uh, trying to identify a kind of er, you know, or basic mm -hmm. uh, nature of who they are, yeah. and yet nobody is a product of that. That's a, if, in fact, when you dig deep enough into that origin, it turns out either to be very diverse mm -hmm. or uh, not politically correct for the people mm -hmm. who are saying, we have a you know this very special special exceptional culture. Yeah. Turns out they're no more exceptional than anyone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, certainly. And and so we're interested in kind of talking. Hopefully, you know, we'll cover the Indian uh, role in the global economy today. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I know your book starts off really far back in mm -hmm. history, and of course, Indian civilization is is so ancient and mm -hmm. rich. Um, but talking about more contemporary or mm -hmm. more recent connections, um, yeah. you know, I think uh, most Americans know India best for Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. and and you know, and so there's that link, Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. and their kind of civil uh, disobedience movement. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting because uh, there are kind of layers that you can pull back. Uh, Gandhi uh, grew up in a part of India, Western India, Gujarat, which uh, was a center of what's known as Jainism, a religion mm -hmm. that believed in harmlessness to all living things and that if you if you harm living things you do so as an act of will that is attachment to the world and mm -hmm. it soils you you don't have to kill things in order to survive a living thing mm -hmm. that, that that experiences pain so the result is that you have this religion that is extremely opposed to any form of violent act so he has that background yeah. kind of in his in his blood in the soil that he lives in uh, but uh, he came to nonviolence uh, through a process of self-reflection, mm -hmm. but also because of influences of others. Uh, India had an, an ancient tradition of civil disobedience, mm -hmm. uh, 
when you have a caste system and social hierarchies, there have to be ways in which justice can be done despite divisions between people by social rank. Uh, so there are holidays in India where the low rank throw gets to throw stuff oh, at people of the higher <laughs> rank. And so, so there have to be ways of negotiating it, uh, negotiating those spaces uh -huh. anyway. But Gandhi was impressed with uh, three other people. Uh, one of them was John Ruskin. Uh, who was an Englishman who believed very deeply in, to, in a, well, he was very important in a crafts movement. Mm -hmm. That is, going back to what we would call basics. He wasn't a hippie, uh, but uh, he was very influential in, in that aspect of looking into the soul and getting at the essential things. Uh, also influential was uh, Tolstoy, oh, uh, really? Count Leo Tolstoy. Uh -huh. uh, Tolstoy had set up uh, communities in Russia in which people practiced the art of living together uh, rather than in competition. Uh -huh. And uh, Gandhi, of course, has this ancient, there's an ancient tradition in India called an ashram. Right. But okay. the idea of having ashrams to gain a political consciousness mm -hmm. within a community uh, rather than the individual achieving moksha or nirvana. And so uh, that, that impressed him greatly and is, uh, had a great deal of influence on his retreats, mm -hmm. uh, which he lived in and worked in and operated from. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King, of course, uh, didn't know Gandhi, but he was a Christian. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi knew Christianity extremely well. Uh, his closest friend, uh, C.F. Andrews, uh -huh. uh, was a missionary. He's actually played by a wonderful actor in the movie Gandhi. Uh -huh. uh, so you get a sense of how close they're, emotionally they were to each other. Basically, definitely committed to the needs of humanity. Yeah. And, and the, the result of that was the Sermon on the Mount meant a great deal to Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And it, it should to everyone. Uh, desire things for other people rather than yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, take care of people who don't have what even what you desire before mm -hmm. you seek it yourself. So, uh, as well as the other well-known passages. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, that had a very important aspect of his life. So it's not surprising that Martin Luther uh, King would actually uh, find Gandhi appealing. Uh, what Martin Luther King did that uh, Gandhi pioneered as a philosophy was a taking on the anger of your opponent as a means of forcing them to see what they are doing mm -hmm. and have an opportunity to repent of the behavior. If you attack uh -huh. someone, they just get more angry at you. Yeah, but yeah. if they attack uh -huh. you and you do nothing, uh -huh. it forces you to ask yourself, what am I doing? And this idea actually exists in the Mahabharata. It's one, mm -hmm. one of the ep ancient epics of India. Oh, but but yeah. this, the, the, this idea that uh, you can uh, resist by not resisting, mm -hmm. and that uh, sparks anger uh, out of guilt, mm -hmm. and that guilt can be handled. Uh, someone who hates as a result of what they perceive as violence, they'll, it'll be very difficult to change their minds. Mm -hmm. But when you receive their violence and you don't fight back, it does force self-realization. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi argued that, mm -hmm. uh, that this, this was the only way mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a, a superior opponent. Mm -hmm. uh, he got in trouble with uh, people asking who got Adolf Hitler after the Holocaust yeah. and said, would nonviolence have helped the Jews? And he had many, uh, he's a very, he had a lot of humor and, and sly irony uh -huh. about him. And he said, well, it wasn't tried in the 1930s. He said, but if it was a tried at the beginning mm -hmm. of oppression of the Jews, enough public attention could have, might have been raised. Mm -hmm. And he said, look at what happened with the alternative. Mm -hmm. But of course, Jews accepted that they were not going to be executed, that mm -hmm. they lived in a civilized society mm -hmm. in which there had been problems before. Yeah. So they thought they could get past it. So, but the British didn't, British used that against Gandhi, uh -huh. you know, and said, uh, you know, it's like the, when people right. like a, a Spicer makes a, a, an error speaking for the government about the Holocaust. Yeah. People are very sensitive when millions of oh, people yeah. die. Mm -hmm. But Gandhi weathered that, explaining, mm -hmm. explaining that in every mm -hmm. other case mm -hmm. that we know, yeah. uh, governments have not been able to withstand a public protest that's nonviolent. Yeah. When there's a mirror put up to them, they, they have to force themselves to look, look at what they are doing. Yes. And, and for other people to, to see that. To more see that clearly. too. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, look at the civil rights movement. Of course, this was what Martin Luther right. King was doing. Mm -hmm. But he was ex King was extremely fortunate because he lived in an age of radio and television. Yes. He could reach everyone. You need that publicity, you right, need for that. it to work. Yes, uh -huh. and Gandhi had to do this mm -hmm. without television, without, with a, you know, what is it, newsreels that only a few people saw, and uh -huh. bare radio, yeah. and, and, and yet everything he did was so visual. Uh -huh. 
but yeah. be because of the drama of it, mm -hmm. it managed to uh, go around the world. Uh, my father, who was an Olympic swimmer and, and later a decorated soldier yeah. in World War II, uh, he said that Gandhi was his, his idol. Oh, so when I said I'm going to be studying Indian history, that was the first thing oh, he said yeah. to me. Oh, so cool. he had an effect. But I think uh, Martin, uh, Martin Luther King gets a special accolade mm -hmm. because he had a population that he could that was, uh, what do you call it, united. Mm -hmm. Whereas in India, mm -hmm. Hindus, Muslims, oh, yeah, Sikhs, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a united population. He knew how to appeal to them directly. Mm -hmm. And he knew how to uh, be, be righteous before the Lord. And mm -hmm. that was really amazing. Stands alone. But yeah. if you go to his museum, Martin Luther King uh, uh -huh. uh, National Center in Atlanta, mm -hmm. there is an entire room devoted to Gandhi's publications mm -hmm. that he collected. Mm -hmm. And his trips to India, mm -hmm. where people uh, were very excited to see him and identified Gandhi and Martin Luther yeah. King together. Yeah, yeah. 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 fascinating In it, yeah. Uh, influences and how they travel. And um, I mean, and going back to, you know, uh, so you know, it, Gandhi is known as also a great leader of India's uh, independence mm -hmm. movement, um, among other things. Among other things. Uh, and, and, you know, interesting about India, so today we know India is kind of a, a rise, um, an emerging economic power, yes. but, you know, really India and the other South Asian economies, after independence, they didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't lean towards like a free market, mm -hmm. uh, competitive model. Maybe mm -hmm. is this the Tolstoy uh, collectivist No, No, it, it, it actually has to do with Cambridge University. <laughs> oh, is that right? Oxford oh, University. okay, another story. Yes, so it's one. another story. What, what happened was in the 1930s, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was tremendous uh, popular feeling about what the the Soviet Union had accomplished mm -hmm. in a very short period of yes, time. Very right. few people were aware of the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 George Bernard Shaw went to the Soviet Union and he said, oh, it's wonderful. You know, they were shown Potemkin villages, yeah. all these other things. But young people, by the time they were going to school in the early 30s, were very impressed by the Soviet experiment. Mm -hmm. And people from the outside the developed world were also even more impressed mm -hmm. because the Soviet Union was going from what they are, which is an agrarian society, and moving very quickly into an industrial society. Mm -hmm. And as the 30s went on, that industrial society in the Soviet Union grew faster and faster and faster. So at school, they thought, collectively, going to school, mm -hmm. uh, that this is the uh, ideology they should pursue. Mm -hmm. And they had lots of left-wing teachers yeah. uh, who had the same point of view, uh, one of whom was a Soviet spy, I suppose. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, the idea was that they, they came by genuinely. They, they saw uh -huh. they needed a new solution. Capitalism was associated with imperialism. Yes. And so they needed another, another, another way. Mm -hmm. And you see this all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, Ho Chi Minh, for example, right. when, he, when he came to Paris, mm -hmm. he, at most he'd be a socialist. Mm -hmm. But after World War I, where the West turned his back on the developing world, he mm -hmm. looked for a, a more dynamic solution and, and found it mm -hmm. you know, in communism. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, starting with the 1930s, people like Nehru, Jawaharlal mm -hmm. Nehru, the first prime minister of India, mm -hmm. he left university in England to join Gandhi's campaign in, the, in about 1919, 1917, mm -hmm. 1919. And he was a devout socialist, but the money that drove the nationalist movement was all from millionaires, uh -huh. like uh, Birla is a very famous one, textile industry, uh -huh. the owners of uh, concrete, uh, the Tata uh, industrial empire. Uh -huh. These were entrepreneurs that were so successful, even the British couldn't suppress their factory activities. Uh, they tried hard, but they couldn't. And so they were giving money to the independence movement because they believed that Gandhi could get rid of the British. Yeah, and yeah. I think they also yeah. believed in Gandhian principles, mm -hmm. but they also knew it was in their self-interest. Mm -hmm. So when independence came, uh, I don't think most Indian leaders wanted to bite the hand that fed them. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an exaggeration. I, I think they're, people are motivated by more things than just money, at least in India, right. uh, all the time anyway. And uh, so the result was that a mixed economy made more sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah said, seek ye first the political kingdom, and then everything good will come from it. Uh, the idea was uh, the government should operate from the commanding uh -huh. heights, mm -hmm. and that would be uh, power, transportation, mm -hmm. uh, the main uh, industries that uh, very often uh, become monopolies from, in terms of private enterprise. Yeah. Uh, so the result was you had a mixed economy with the government owning these, the mm -hmm. larger means of production, but entrepreneurialism rife, as it would always be yeah. in a country that was entrepreneurial from the day one. Uh, uh, Harappa around 5,000 years, uh, well, 2,500 BC, mm -hmm. uh, were enterprising merchants uh, mm -hmm. all, all, all over the Indian Ocean and as far as Egypt. Yeah, so yeah. we can expect them to continue on in that tradition, and they, mm -hmm. they did. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But there were problems. But mm -hmm. you might, 
Right now, there was a thing called essentially a rule by regulation, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was just so much bureaucracy, it was actually holding back industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Rajiv Gandhi, as prime minister in the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, simply attacked it and uh, also sponsored a new uh, uh, technology yeah. uh, and a service economy mm -hmm. over a manufacturing mm -hmm. economy. Yeah. And the result was by, by 2000, over 6% growth mm. every yeah. year. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, so we'll come back and continue yeah, this uh, well, conversation, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Okay, so you're watching Global Connections with Grace Chang and Mark Gilbert talking about South Asia and the contemporary global economy. Back in one minute. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. You're watching ThinkTech on ThinkTechHawaii.com, which broadcasts five live talk shows from noon to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams our earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha. Welcome back to Global Connections with Grace Chang. I'm joined by Dr. Mark Gilbert, the NEH Endowed Chair for World History at Hawaii Pacific University. So, Mark, we are going to continue our discussion about South Asia, and we're, you know, we're interested in specifically, especially India and the global economy today. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we're talking about what's distinctive about South Asia. And just talk about, touch upon another, um, you know, South Asian country, uh, Bhutan, mm -hmm. which, you know, is a is a probably less less well known, but it's it is known for its its idea of trying to reach a, the highest level of gross national happiness. Yes, instead of gross national product. Right, right. Yes, so. exactly, gross <laughs> national happiness. Contrast the economic goal, yeah. yeah. Well, we're very fortunate here in Hawaii because uh, the uh, uh, NEH, uh, Na uh, National Government for Humanities Council in Hawaii, and also the Museum of Art, I had a massive uh, Bhutan uh, exhibit a couple, few years ago. And so we should here in Hawaii be better than most people when you just say Bhutan. It's true, yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, Bhutan is a very special place because mm -hmm. it's really all that's left of traditional uh, Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan mm -hmm. Buddhist culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a monarchy for hundreds of years. Uh, the British, uh, like Nepal, uh, chose to allow these states to be independent, or at least autonomous in their internal affairs, with a resident that would watch over it. And, but unlike Nepal, uh, Bhutan uh, was able to remain aloof from most of the, re the rest of the world uh, and developed a, a very environmentally sustainable way of living mm -hmm. and also developed a monarchy that was very identif de identified itself with the people. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, about a, uh, two decades ago, the king decided that with the way things were going in the world, the, what we call a rapid cultural change mm -hmm. uh, globalization, mm -hmm. as, as if the people never left Africa and spread around throughout right, the entire right. world. <laughs> it's the pace of yeah. connections between peoples mm -hmm. and cultures and, and continents that is different. And he saw this change coming very quickly, and he knew that Bhutan could not uh, keep pace with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so he decided that he would abdicate eventually, mm -hmm. uh, but he would put in place a system of education, of uh, democracy, uh, and of uh, development mm -hmm. that was suited to the Bhutanese people. Uh, and that's what's known as the movement towards gross national happiness. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is the people didn't want it. Uh, they, oh. For the most part, they loved their king. Uh -huh. uh, I, I remember uh, there was a unionization of a business, and the manager prevented unionization simply by taking really good care of his employees mm -hmm. and, and making sure that they were happy. Then there was no need for unionization. I'm speaking of my father, right. by the way, uh -huh. uh, who is pro-union. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the issue is that the king took, uh, managed the state so effectively that people saw no need uh, to, uh, to him, for him to abdicate. Uh -huh. But the real benefit, of course, was that this gradual process enabled his much younger son to be able to start off as king, mm -hmm. as a mature adult, mm -hmm. and with a wide understanding of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
uh, also did away with the idea of uh, what England is facing now in a different minor key, which is a, a queen that simply keeps living yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, out, is, may outlive her son, for uh -huh. all we know. <laughs> and so, so this en enables the idea of uh, transition, uh, it becomes more possible. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of educated Bhutanese who saw the value of it mm -hmm. and also saw the pitfalls. But uh, Bhutan is very fortunate uh, amongst other countries besides its kind of Buddhist uh, uh, sense of collective good and also a king that mm -hmm. believed in it, uh, but it happens to have water resources. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because it's uh, in, in the Terai and then the Himalayas itself, uh -huh. it has plentiful water which everybody wants. Yes. Uh, it's a big problem mm -hmm. in India today mm -hmm. is in, and also China uh, mm -hmm. indirectly or more directly. But the important thing is that they decided to get take Chinese money and build gigantic power generating and well water generating uh -huh. plants that produce electricity that are literally buried in mountains that you so you can't actually see them mm -hmm. and they're in gorges that don't have people that need to be removed oh, because good. essentially in India uh -huh. you have to flood lots of terrain right. and then essentially and in, mm -hmm. and with the Yangtze mm -hmm. uh, three yeah, gorges yeah, lots of controversy a lot, a lot of controversy yeah, yeah people mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. don't get the removal benefits they no. thought they get <laughs> uh, and in India the Supreme Court has simply turned away from them. We can talk about that if yeah. we want. But the idea is that it doesn't harm the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it generates things that people need. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least for the next 50 years or so, mm -hmm. there'll be plenty of glacier melt mm -hmm. for them to profit. Because uh, yeah. India, <laughs> India, will, India will buy all the energy and all, and, and all the water use yeah. that they can get. Uh, the problem is, yes, they're a small country. As things, uh, what is it, get hard and harder as the environment changes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, we're all in, we'll all be in that same boat here in Hawaii and everywhere else. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how they negotiate that mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. as I'm always interested in seeing how my students will write papers on the subject <laughs> and come to some kind of conclusion that isn't depressing. Because yeah, no. it is a remarkable, remarkable experiment mm -hmm. in, uh, in building a, a nation and a community. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and this kind of a coordination at the regional level to be able to do this in a thoughtful manner, not kind of in a rush to reach high levels of growth and then... Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I, th I think that's, yeah, that's promising. That's a good thing to hear yeah, about. And, and there's also another thing, this problem of immigration. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody has immigrant workers who mm -hmm. have become part of their society yeah, and find yes. themselves identifying with it. Mm -hmm. And many Nepalese had done that yes. uh, in the, under the old regime in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And when the new regime took over, they saw the necessity for pushing some of them out. Mm -hmm. And this was very controversial. Yeah. Uh, more recently, some have been let back in. So that could be a lesson to everybody. Back into Bhutan. Yeah, back into okay. Bhutan. Uh -huh. So listen to everybody that, uh, you know, uh, uh, how you handle, well, I'm sure it's in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> how you handle your immigrants is how, how your soul represents itself to God. Yeah. So it's interesting that the Buddhists in, in Bhutan understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this migration, we're hearing a lot of this controversy, right, with the Rohingya migrating, uh, in, being mm -hmm. forced to migrate into Bangladesh. I mean, the region, these kinds of national borders are, are creating all of these kinds of, all of these controversies. Things. I mean, the, you know, movement of people historically is, is quite natural, but, you know, some of the reasons for it, right, is, is problematic. Um, but, you know, but back to India as, mm -hmm. as an emerging uh, economic power in the mm -hmm. world. And we hear a lot about India and China. Um, but, but, you know, is, what do you think? Do you think that there is a claim that it, the Indian economy might pass the Chinese economy in the future? Well, at least be number two to China. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, the United States being third, I think, in that particular mm -hmm. thing. Uh, well, it's interesting because, uh, of course, we all live in a precedence. A, a, a precedentist view of the world, yeah, right? Yeah. So China is this rising dynamic economy. Mm -hmm. uh, American money from purchasing Chinese goods is vastly expanding the Chinese yeah, economy. Uh -huh. People, uh, the group of tourists of Hawaii is looking for in the future are yeah. Chinese. Mm -hmm. They spend more money and spend mm -hmm. more every day. Uh, as tourists than mm -hmm. Japanese passing tourists. Passing on the consumerism. Yes, passing <laughs> on the consumerism. There's no question yeah. about that. Yes, there. Yes, it's. Uh, there's a thing called capitalism in China, but it's known by the word what is it? Uh, chi uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, and uh, the problem is that the population is aging rapidly uh -huh, in China. Yeah. Uh, the the one child mm -hmm. uh, per family. Uh, was a very good policy considering the alternative, mm -hmm. which was massive overpopulation before the Chinese economy yeah. could even cope with it. But now, you know, they have uh, raised a bunch of very spoiled children, mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. uh, to replace those who are aging. And China is grappling with that all by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, China is about the same size as the United States, but yes. it only has the arable land of mm -hmm. the 13 colonies. Yeah. 
So it, it's very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, it has not been successful mm -hmm. in attempts to stop desertification. It's mm -hmm. working hard, planting yeah. trees, but as recently just happened in Beijing, yeah. it's been the d dust the has desert, raised it to yeah, some 800 storms. units, mm -hmm. in, when 100 mm -hmm. units is uh, helpful. And how does India yeah. compare as far as well, the land resources? Well, if you look at Delhi, yeah. <laughs> they had the same thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> Delhi imagine, is becoming right? rapidly unlivable mm -hmm. because of industrialization in the, that part of India and yeah. the prevailing air currents, uh -huh. and which is off a desert as well uh, yeah. until you get to the Himalayas. So. Uh, so uh, India has a younger population. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a democracy. Mm -hmm. China is not. Mm -hmm. uh, China has the advantage of long-range planning for big industrial development. Mm -hmm. India has thousands upon thousands of entrepreneurs yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to its roots as a as a almost literally an international civilization. Yeah. Yeah. And so the result is that uh, you can expect India to uh, to uh, re achieve the same things that Western economies mm -hmm. have achieved. Uh, for example, they make generic drugs mm -hmm. uh, equivalent to that, of, mm -hmm. and they don't charge $100,000 right, a right, month. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting uh -huh. is that yeah. India is part of a consortium of essentially selling retroviral drugs to Africa mm -hmm. for co mm -hmm. virtually cost, mm -hmm. whereas the United the American yeah. capitalists, even Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, yeah. haven't stood up for that. Uh, Bill Gates has, of course, helped eradicate mm -hmm. the river blindness. Mm -hmm. But you don't see that kind of international commitment mm -hmm. that Indian corporations have made yeah. because it's it's good business right, in the future right, yeah. and Indian merchants in the past uh, as a kind of adjunct to colonial mm -hmm. British colonial enterprise uh, were seen as a kind of suspect merchant yeah, class yeah. So and there is this uh, they, entrepreneurial as well as innovation in, yeah. in the spirit that we can, yeah. you know, we can see how, well, how that, given the limitations that both the Indian and Chinese economies have, yeah. but that innovation is an in entrepreneurial spirit is, is quite yeah. important, They're which quite you, important. you address. It. And we, we hopefully can have you back to talk about oh, this yes. in more detail because oh, sure. we are out of or time, new, unfortunately. Or new things like Bangladesh. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, yes. yes. I mean, Very South Asia place. really is, yeah, yes. a fascinating region. Uh -huh. Many things to discuss these days. So yes. thank you so much oh, for no, being my here, pleasure. Mark. It was yeah. wonderful being talking to you. Some yeah. other time, please. Yep. <laughs> All right, thank you for tuning in to Global Connections with me, Grace Chang, and my guest, Dr. Mark Gilbert from Hawaii Pacific University. Join me here every Thursday at 1 p.m. See you next time. Aloha.